I'm not a theologian. Um, I may have been a few things in my time, but not, not a theologian. Studied a bit of theology because I am an ordained Anglican uh, clergyman, as you mentioned, and that has given me some access to the theological thought world. I'm certainly um, a, a regular but amateur student of philosophy, um, and 100 years ago I did do the famous politics, philosophy and economics course at Oxford, which gave me an insight into some of the issues that I want to tease out. Um, there are a number of you here who've heard me um, and now, now twice, actually, in some, of your, in some cases, yesterday and the day before at the Academy of Science. Um, and you'll have to bear with me because some of this is, is a repetition of some of that. Um, but, but, but please keep awake because not all of it is. Um, but I do want to start with a point which I did start from um, the other day. Um, uh, and that's a geographical and a geopolitical starting point. In fact, I think as a general matter, it's quite helpful if we're doing realistic theology to start, as it were, from the outside in and not from the inside, that is to say the history of Christian theology and its language and its thought processes and work outwards to the real world. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said for starting the other way round uh, with the real world. And what is striking about the real world of the 21st century um, is that Eurasia, meaning the landmass on which we all live, and which extends from Ireland at one end to Vladivostok at the other um, as a single continent, um, is the centre of the world's attention and will continue to be, really, for the next century. Uh, it is two-thirds of the world's population. It produces about two-thirds of the world's economic output. And all of the world's great cultural traditions originate within Eurasia. And indeed, most of them still have their centre of gravity in Eurasia, uh, though Christianity is an arguable exception to that, uh, since it is arguable that the centre of gravity of Christianity is somewhere between the Americas and Africa nowadays. As connections have been established and broadened, knowledge of our context has, of course, rapidly grown. The Romans and the Han Chinese, at the turn of the uh, Christian era, knew about each other's existence, but of course they'd never come into contact with each other. And at that point, nobody had been from one end of the landmass to the other. And even as late as the uh, late Middle Ages, nobody had been from one end to the other, although there were some epic journeys. Uh, uh, Marco Polo's Ibn Battuta, the great Muslim traveler, um, uh, Xuanzang, the great Chinese traveler, uh, who brought, essentially brought who reinforced the position of Buddhism in China by his epic journey to India. Um, so th there were some, but very few. Uh, nowadays, of course, matters are completely different. Uh, in 15 hours, you can fly from one end to the other, and digitally, you can connect instantaneously. But what's emerged is not any kind of shared polity or sense of common identity, or at least not yet. Uh, growing connectivity and interaction have not produced any sense of shared interest or common purpose uh, in what is two-thirds of the world's humanity. Rather, all of the jostling has produced a balance amongst a handful of dominant powers, each with its own identity rooted in its own history and self-understanding. I think we Europeans tend to be embarrassed about the thought of the nation-state and about the thought of cultural identities and cultural assertiveness. Uh, we have a particular history which accounts for that embarrassment. Um, we are apt to assume that this is a global phenomenon and it isn't. The nation state and the strong cultural identity that interlocks and underpins a nation state is alive and well and living in most Asian countries. And I think that's an extremely important difference between the modern Europe and the modern Asia. Um, we need to be aware of it. There is, in fact, indeed, a if anything, a rising sense of cultural nationalism around the world, and especially in points east of here. And therefore, the new world stage is populated by uh, a number of particularly influential countries with very strong senses of their own purpose, place in the world, traditions and history, and self-awareness. 
By the dawn of the new millennium, it was becoming clear which these dominant powers are. China, of course, we talked uh, a good deal about that the other night, and I'm not going to focus particularly on China today. Um, India, the two beer moths of Eurasia. Russia, um, is it Asian or is it Europe? Um, the great question about the Russian identity is it schizophrenia about which way it faces, and certainly it's ill at ease with all of its neighbors. Japan, which we don't talk about enough in my view, uh, and whose strong sense of cultural identity and nationalistic purpose we tend to underestimate. Uh, Japan with its uniquely strong social psychology, perhaps more impenetrably different than any other major society on earth. And then there's America, not of course a geographically a Eurasian power and yet bound into Eurasian geopolitics uh, uh, by its own strategic interests. The only Eurasian power that's present at both ends of the landmass as a result of the Second World War, uh, although it's losing interest at this end of the landmass, it is definitely not losing interest in what goes on at the other end. And then what about the Europeans? Prosperous and yet struggling to achieve cohesion and unsure of what it stands for. And as Vern has already remarked, um, uh, on Friday, Britain legally leaves the European Union, to my personal deep regret. Uh, today, the European Parliament is presumably going to vote approval for the deal under which Britain leaves. It's a sad day. Um, and then what about the Muslim Ummah, the other uh, great cultural area of Eurasia, um, uh, whose central gravity um, uh, in, 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 in power and authoritative terms is the Middle East, although numerically actually not, it's in Southeast Asia. Um, but it, in terms of the kind of central gravity of what it stands for, yes, it's the Middle East for all the obvious reasons. Uh, what about the Muslim Ummah? Fractured even more than Europe is, um, and indeed lethally fractured at the moment. Um, fractured religiously and not just politically. Um, unsure again of how uh, what it stands for in the modern world and how to come to terms with modernity. So at the dawn of the new millennium, this Eurasian balance looks increasingly like uh, what in the European context became known as the Westphalian order. And we did talk about this the other night, uh, but I want to repeat it because I think it's important. The Westphalian order was established in the wake of 1648, the treaties uh, signed in Osnabrück and Münster. Um, works on the principle that cultures differ and that national governments are sovereign um, and that they respect the balance of power and do not interfere in the domestic culture of each other's uh, domains. Europe arrived in this position in 1648 by exhaustion at the end of the Thirty Years' War. Eurasia in the 21st century seems to be arriving at it through mutual recognition of realities based on two things, really, the extraordinary transformation of economic power that has been taking place for the last 30 years, and secondly, nuclear proliferation. Let me talk a little bit about that shift of the balance of economic power. For we now recognize that a historic convergence is underway. In 1820, it's worth remembering that the largest economy in the world was China and the second largest was India. That was because at that time, the size of your economy in relation to others was essentially equal to the size of your population in relation to others. And China then as now had the largest population in the world and India as then as now had the second largest. Uh, we all know what happened after that. The Industrial Revolution meant that for the first time in human history, uh, uh, economic surpluses could be created and a country could achieve a larger share of world output than its population warranted. So first Britain, then other Europeans, the Germans, uh, the Americans, and the Japanese. Uh, and at their height, that group of countries produced about 75% of global output on the basis of never more than 15, 16, 17% of world population. The discrepancy became huge, and it took only 100 years, 150 years, to get there. But what's now happening is that that gap is beginning to close again. As country after country in Asia, and of course above all China, start to catch up uh, with the economic output per head 
and therefore the standards of living per head that Europeans have come to take for granted. Within a few years, in fact, on present trends, China will be the world's largest economy again, in all probability. And we're familiar with this set of facts. Uh, it's worth noticing that that point at which China becomes the world's largest economy sometime in the 2020s is just a milestone. Because China is likely, as the other developing countries are likely to, continue to grow relatively rapidly compared with the sluggish growth rates of the older economies, Europe, Japan, and even the United States. And therefore, uh, within a generation, China is likely not merely to be the biggest, but by far the biggest economy in the world. And I'm not sure that we have all come to terms with that thought. It represents a challenge in all sorts of ways. It represents a challenge economically. Uh, uh, all sorts of tricky decisions, large and small, are going to be uh, put into the entrees of governments around the world. Uh, just yesterday, to go back to my own country, Britain, uh, the British government decided on a formula for allowing Huawei to compete in the 5G network rollout in Britain. Germany uh, came to a similar decision just before Christmas, and in both cases, they were agonizing about the strategic and geopolitical significance of that decision, as well as about its economic consequences. And that's just one example of the kind of decision-making that is going to uh, confront uh, European governments and, of course, North American ones as well, in, uh, and indeed, uh, South Asian governments, uh, for the foreseeable future as a result of China's extraordinary emergence as an economic powerhouse. For the Europeans, there's a more fundamental question too. Uh, wherein lies our longer-term competitive advantage, our comparative advantage, to use economics to speak? Uh, we fret uh, because Asian technical brilliance s seems to be coming at us like a rising tide, even in the very areas of strength that we've prided ourselves on whether it was primary research as opposed to mere application, artistic creativity as opposed to mere excellence in performance, elegance and originality of design as opposed to imitation and kitsch. In all of these ways, we've tended to want to believe that there are some uh, areas of, uh, some mountains we can sit on top of that we will know, which we know will be safe from the rising tide. But the honest truth is that with every passing year, it becomes ever clearer that there are almost certainly no European heights that Asians cannot at least eventually scale. The Americans face the same challenge, of course. But Europeans, if we're being honest, ruefully recognize how, much, how the much greater inventiveness, drive, and flexibility of the American society and of its economy has enabled them to continue to reinvent themselves in the most unpredictable ways. You don't have to be a fan of either the present American administration or indeed the American system of governance in general to recognize what an extraordinarily dynamic and creative society it nevertheless is. No European country was able to match the spectacular successes of Silicon Valley, uh, which few had even heard of at the point when China began to open up some 30 years ago. As a friend of mine once said, uh, an economist friend of mine once said, never short America for very long. But as far as Europe is concerned, it's retreating uh, from being the self-defined center of the world, 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, to what it had been before the 15th century, just a corner of the Eurasian landmass. And what's more, it is no longer strategically significant to America because it has no longer got the front line of the Cold War running through it. So China and the United States are increasingly wary of each other, as we know from almost every day's newspapers. And as they kind of watch each other and circle around each other, they both recognize what is happening to Europe and that it is losing its historical importance. In fact, I, uh, one Chinese diplomat once said, um, not entirely wrongly and slightly, slightly unkindly, what Europe is good for is museums and education. So what's going on in the world? Um, 30 years ago, uh, just over, 
the Berlin Wall came down and huge changes were ushered in, including the opening up of China and the liberalization of India and many other changes as well, obviously near a home in Eastern Europe. There was tragedy as well as, uh, uh, as, as the excitement of it all. I, 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 there would be plenty, plenty of us here who will remember 1989 in all its aspects. Uh, we were living in Hong Kong at the time and uh, therefore the, the uh, tragedy of Tiananmen Square was very present to our minds. Um, and yet despite the tragedy, the new dawn was extraordinary. New hope for hundreds of millions of people especially in Asia, especially in China, actually. Economically, it ushered in huge change and brought enormous fruits in terms of real increases in living standards for very large numbers of people. And for all the difficulties we now see in retrospect, we should never forget that extraordinary human achievement. We have seen in the last 30 years the biggest material change for the largest number of people in one generation that the world has ever seen. Nevertheless, that very achievement led to excesses and to an overweening confidence. Um, we know about the economic crisis of 2007-8 and onwards. Um, ideologically, free market liberalism and its associated belief that elective democracy would automatically sweep the world uh, seems to have won the day. Famously, Francis Fukuyama wrote his essay in 1989, which has rather dogged him ever since, uh, called The End of History. He did put a question mark at the end, which is sometimes forgotten. Um, it's a short essay, you can read it, um, and it, it essentially was an optimistic view uh, that with the demise of the Soviet Union and the opening up of China, you were going to see the release into individual life and the ability to achieve on the part of uh, potentially billions of people um, and that free liberal uh, democracy would sweep the world. It was all nice and simple and, of course, too much so. Uh, we learned some painful truths later on about economics, that markets are not stable or self-stabilizing. They're not like gyroscopes, if you will, that automatically write themselves. And that societies are not just collections of individuals. Indeed, there was something of a, uh, uh, there has been a growing um, pushback against the very idea that economic progress necessarily goes with elective democracy. China in particular certainly doesn't believe that that's the case. They have indeed allowed the flourishing of a very substantial private sector. Uh, about half of the Chinese economy is now in private sector hands. Um, but it's never, one should not forget, of course, that half, the other half is still in state hands. Um, but nevertheless, um, they do not see this uh, growing economic pluralism as leading automatically to any kind of um, uh, elective democratic approach. Um, and not just the Chinese. Uh, you will hear perhaps the most articulate exponents of an alternative view are actually the Singaporeans, um, who uh, will regularly argue um, that, that elective democracy is not the best way of running at least a developing society, um, and that long-term focus and a holistic view of the interests of society as a whole are better achieved through, through what is in effect a kind of enlightened platonic republic and, 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 the, and the associated approach for discussion as to who's right. And then there's something else going on. Uh, and this is uh, something that's even more recent uh, than the great changes of the 90s and the noughties. For this is the uh, spread of competence in artificial intelligence. This is early days yet, and yet we can see how this is going to radically reshape economies, all economies, developing and developed over the next generation or so. Businesses will no longer need to manufacture in low-cost labor markets, and that means uh, that the first step on the ladder of modernization, which was the first step out of poverty for today's middle-income countries like China, will no longer necessarily be available to the next generation of poor countries with low skill bases. It's a real issue when you think about the prospects for Africa. It will also threaten more and more administrative and middle management office jobs even in the high income countries. So the social impact of artificial intelligence is pervasive and we're still in the very early days of it. 
we are also in the very early days of beginning to think what some of the ethical and political implications are of the arrival of increasingly sophisticated artificial intelligence. At what point does an artificially intelligent being acquire rights, for example? Then socially, and this is a separate point from the point about artificial intelligence, uh, this has been the dawn of the digital revolution, especially with the rise of social media. Uh, they are transforming the way whole societies work, and again, we're still in the fairly early days of understanding exactly how that will all work out. Um, but what we do know is that our lives are already being changed radically in all of their aspects, in work, in family, uh, and in our social relationships. Um, uh, many of us in this room um, will have grown up without the social media, uh, my daughters grew up without the social media. My grandchildren are in the thick of it. And even between daughter and grandchildren, you can see the difference in the way they go about things. One important point about the social media to focus on, I think, is that they've given the, what you might call the demos, a new voice. By demos, I mean, in this case, the unorchestrated opinions of ordinary people. Uh, it's fashionable for established elite political voices to deride much of this as just populism. But the truth is that no one um, in business or in politics or indeed in any public leadership position can any longer simply ignore its moods and demands. For the social media have turned what the scientists used to call the butterfly effect into a major social phenomenon as images can go viral in a way that is often unpredictable and uncontrollable. The digital world has its bright side and its dark side. We know this because all human creativity does. What is less often noted is that the digital revolution is potentially a source of further inequality. That immense connectivity which it gives can be used as a powerful aid to education, to self-education, to, to cultural enrichment of the human being, but it can be used also to squander a life in mindless gaming activity and worse. It can offer powerful leverage or wasteful distraction on a scale previously unimaginable. Then there's another great phenomenon of our time uh, related to that, um, not exactly the same, and in fact, an I would argue an underlying cause of it, and that is urbanization, which uh, we've already alluded to. This is the age of urbanization. This is the age uh, of uh, human experience in cities. Year 2008 was the year in which more than half, the, we passed the point where more than half the world's population lives in cities, and on present trends, uh, this number will rise to 80% well before the end of this century. In Europe, it's already at 80% or higher. In Western Europe, it's 90. In Eastern Europe, it's lower but rising. Uh, in Asia, it's in the 50s, rising towards 60. But again, it will rise up to 80 uh, within the next few decades. The de degree of transformation that that will bring about is still, I think, not widely enough recognized. We are moving from most of human history lived out by most people in the natural environment, gaining their living from interaction with nature directly, to a situation where most people live in big cities uh, with ruptured connections with the natural environment. And all the way from the uh, observation that children growing up in cities now don't see the stars and have precious little idea where their milk comes from, through to uh, the environmental impact of urbanization, this is changing human experience and self-consciousness, and we still don't fully understand all of its outworkings. It raises all sorts of questions because it, the city breaks down older social structures most people who come to the cities have migrated from rural areas. It is still true that most city uh, inhabitants are migrants, not necessarily from overseas, of course, but from somewhere else, usually much smaller. And they find themselves freed from the older traditional structures which set 
the context and rules and expectations for their lives. All of a sudden, they find themselves in a city and they may be prosperous or they may be marginal, but in either case, the rules have weakened and in some cases gone away completely. So the question of how they live their lives, what communities they form, um, becomes one which is a matter of choice uh, or at least of flexible options, whereas previously it was determined. This is a huge change in human history and we're still working our way through it. Uh, I've seen with my own eyes some of the most extraordinary manifestations of this change. Uh, we were, as mentioned, living in Hong Kong. Um, we were in Hong Kong in the 80s and early 90s. And in the 80s, when you went up to the border of Hong Kong and you looked across, uh, you could see in the middle distance a little town called Shenzhen across the duck farms and the rice paddies. Uh, it was a rather sleepy uh, little place of, with a population of about 20 or 30,000. Shenzhen now is a city of about 12 million people. If you go there, it's, there are hundred, literally hundreds of skyscrapers. If you stand at the top of one of those skyscrapers and look back at Hong Kong, you can't see the border any longer. Um, it's an extraordinary transformation in just 30 years. And I now live in London. Uh, I don't come from London, as Werner mentioned, but I now live in London. Uh, London is measurably the most international city in the world. Uh, more people from more places than any other city in the world. Um, if you go on the London underground, uh, the chances are you will hear, hear umpteen other languages being spoken around you as you, as you sit there. Um, I find this exhilarating and enriching. Some people find it stressful and infuriating. The whole issue of the way in which urbanization changes the way we expect to relate to other people is one of the most profound and significant developments in human experience, and we're living through it. The result of all of this is that geopolitical risks are probably higher now than they have been for a generation. Today's European geopolitics are in some ways like those of 19th century Europe, and that's not an inspiring parallel, uh, because we know what happened uh, in Europe in the run-up to 1914 and indeed thereafter in the middle of the century. To begin with, we have to remember uh, that in the, on that Eurasian stage now, there are at least five established nuclear powers and six others with varying degrees of commitment to and capability of nuclearization relatively quickly. There's at least one rogue state that might be ready to play the sort of role that Serbia played in the summer of 1914. And as already mentioned, cultural identities are alive and well and increasingly assertive. Think not only about China, uh, whose street level patriotism would be well advised to recognize the importance of, but also India under the Modi government, or Russia under Putin, or Iran, or Turkey under Erdogan, and Saudi Arabia in its new incarnation. And we can see where the potential flashpoints are. South China Sea, Taiwan Straits, the Korean Peninsula, and the cauldron of the Middle East. All of this is playing out in the context of what we all know to be the major looming challenge for us all uh, over the next century, which is, of course, the planetary threat I don't want to dwell on this very long because we're all very familiar with the challenge involved, but the fact is that whether you're Chinese or British or Irish, whichever end of the Eurasian landmass you come from, and indeed, of course, in this case, the whole world is affected, uh, we're facing a gigantic problem that the economists describe as a problem of the commons. A problem of the commons uh, was uh, famously described first by Thomas Malthus, who was an, actually an English clergyman, of all things. Um, uh, and he set it out in stark demographic terms just before the turn of the 19th century, just before the Industrial Revolution really got going. And he argued that populations always tend to expand, to use up the available resources that are free, such that no improvement in living standards can ever occur. He was wrong, of course. Uh, he didn't foresee that there would in fact be a remorseless rise of the uh, global population starting fairly soon after when he wrote and that income standards would nevertheless start to rise in a way that was historically completely unknown. 
in the 19th century. He didn't foresee all of that, and subsequently doomsayers about limits to growth have been repeatedly embarrassed because they failed to foresee how human technological progress has been able to maximize yields, find new resources, get around shortages of particular resources, and so growth has gone on exceeding expectations. And yet we now face a situation where the problem of commons is not about any one resource or any one area uh, of land or anything like that. It is, of course, about the planet as a whole. And the demographic challenge is now so enormous that we do have to ask ourselves the question uh, whether we are facing an enormous problem of the commons in this new connected urbanized era which is going to dominate increasingly all of the political agendas of all of the countries that we've been talking about before the end of this century. Some parts of the environment are pure examples of commons, that is to say assets that are, are free um, and which are going to get overused because they're free. The, uh, you, we think of the oceans, of the Arctic ice cap, of the stratosphere into which we pump our carbon dioxide. These are all pure examples of economic commons. There are other global assets that are not pure commons in the sense that they're under sovereign control. Tropical rainforests, for the most part, for example. Uh, fresh water in Asia, for example. And the irony is that in a Westphalian system of relationship between countries, between sovereign powers, dealing with the problem of the commons when they are not pure commons, but they are under the ownership of particular sovereigns, is ironically more difficult it is more difficult, probably, to deal with the tropical rainforests than to deal with the Arctic ice cap. Indeed, we've seen it in a sense because Antarctica is one of the great success stories of human cooperation to keep it pristine. It's a common. It's not under the sovereign control of anybody. Dealing with the Brazilian government over tropical rainforest, on the other hand, has famously, this last year or so, proven to be a very tricky political challenge. So there we go. As urbanization and economic development and demographic pressure continue, the demand for uh, these kinds of assets will continue to rise. It's very hard to foresee uh, uh, a point where um, the, the threat to tropical rainforests, the threat to fresh water, will stop rising. Because the honest truth is uh, that as populations increase, Human beings naturally expect the sorts of standard of living that we, frankly, take for granted. And it would be hard to envisage, therefore, these shortages, these threats to the environmental balance, not becoming increasingly severe flashpoints of geopolitical tension in the decades to come. So, what is to be done? To use Lenin's famous question. And it would be easy to despair or to assume that the challenges are so huge that all we can do is deal with the problems of today. And if that was all there was to be said about the next several decades to the end of this century, say, it wouldn't ogre well. As noted, the Westphalian parallel, the European experience of the Westphalian order, is not encouraging. Uh, indeed, the Westphalian order could be argued to have created the conditions that resulted in the terrible first half of the 20th century in Europe. What might still be hoped for and worked for would, of course, be painstaking consensus on matters of direct and obvious shared interest. On the environment and climate change, there, is some, uh, there are clear efforts underway to get an international consensus together. On scarce natural resources, on international terrorism, on nuclear non-proliferation, uh, and to mention something that's topical, of course, the risk of pandemics. And these are not trivial gains by any means, but it would nevertheless suggest that at least for the foreseeable future, for the, let's say the next, the next century, we would have reached some sort of limit to the human journey of exploration of our own dignity and worth and significance. But in fact, I want to argue uh, that there won't be, and indeed can't be, an enduring Westphalian stasis. Uh, there is, in fact, a direction of travel in human affairs, and there has to be. Even if the journey ahead is long and risky, uh, 
just as the journey so far has been long and risky and full of twists and turns. There will be roadblocks and wrong turnings for sure, because there have always been. But I think the direction can't be reversed and it won't be possible to settle where we are. The reason is that the individual has always been significant in human cultures, and I want to explore the significance of that thought, really, for the rest of my remarks this morning. We have a little idea, of course, of the self-awareness of the individuals in the communities who painted the walls of Eurasian caves some 40 millennia ago. And for most of history, the vast majority of human beings have left no record of their feelings. On the other hand, we do know some things. Uh, we know that human beings have never just seen themselves as soldier ants. And even in the most structured hierarchies of human history, where slaves had no rights, women had very few, humans have always had individual selves. They've always had names. We have buried the dead. So we know about mortality and we reflect on the significance of mortality. And as a result, the metaphysics of all Eurasian cultures have explored the place of the human soul or spirit in the scheme of things. And this metaphysical musing has taken a huge variety of forms, from the ancient Indian sense of the endless cycle of birth and rebirth, to an acute sense of human aloneness in a life which is a be-all and end-all, which characterizes some least of European thought in the late 19th, early 20th, and perhaps even now, uh, centuries. And alongside this metaphysical musing about the soul, human art and literature has always sought to explore humanity in its actual experience of being, in all its life, loves, its losses, its hurts, its transience, its moments of joy. And this creativity has, uh, that, that has been called forth is to be found in all Eurasian cultures and down the ages until uh, now, from, very, from the very earliest times. There are many differences in specific contexts and perspectives, of course. But some of the greatest achievements of Eurasian creativity do have a strange universality and timelessness about them. I quoted, in our, for those of us who were here yesterday, uh, a Tang Dynasty poet writing about the grief of the grave of his three-year-old daughter. It's a very moving little uh, poem uh, from about 1,200 years ago. We know the name of the girl. We know where it happened. It's very, somehow, uh, uh, right near us, despite the t distance in time and in culture. And that's just one example. You think, I think, too, of the Lady Murasaki, who wrote the first great novel of the world, the first novel of the world, um, some hundreds of years before either the Chinese or the Europeans were writing novels, the Japanese Lady Murasaki produced The Tale of Genji. If you have not read that, I can't recommend it strongly enough. If you really want to understand and grapple with um, a culture that's very different and yet at some levels recognisably full of human beings as well. You read passages, it's a story of the lives and loves of the imperial court circle in, in, in Kyoto uh, uh, around a thousand years ago. And some parts of that you read with her extremely shrewd observations of the way human beings interact with each other in different circumstances, as if this was Jane Austen or Theodore Fontane or other European 19th century novelists that I can think of. There's something timeless about them for all of the obvious cultural differences and, and the passage of ages. Or Cao Zhe-Chun's equally poignant Dream of the Red Mansions, China, I think China's greatest classical novel. Uh, an extraordinary work written in the late 17th, early 18th centuries um, about the uh, uh, about the slow decline of a family and the lives and loves that are going to go wrong in this rather poignant and tragic, uh, uh, rather isolated circumstance. Um, it is China's answer, except I think it's much greater, it's China's answer to Buddenbrooks. Brooks. 
So there you have it. And I, and I could go on, of course. Hafez, the Iranian poet, who has an exuberant love of life and living, and his poetry uh, it just sort of raises your spirits just by reading it even now. Um, Rabindranath Tagore's moving story of a girl who absorbs and then is destroyed by an identity given to her by others in the village, which Satyajit Ray, the great Indian director, made into one of his greatest films, Devi, D-E-V-I. And again, if you've not seen that, do please watch it as an insight into the humanity within a culture, which is in many ways very obviously different, and yet at that deeper underlying sense this is human beings at work again. And then finally, but I could go on reading out examples of this, uh, for a great modern Japanese film, uh, one of, I think, the greatest films of all time, Tokyo Story, filmed in 1953, I think, the early 1950s anyhow, by uh, Ozu, who is, I think, the greatest Japanese director, greater than Kurosawa, if I'm allowed to say it. Um, it's the story of the elderly parents who visit the young married couple in Tokyo uh, with their two children. The young couple, couple are too busy to pay them much attention or respect. The two children are a bit bored with their grandparents who turn up. One of the grandparents gets ill and then dies. And the tragedy, it, it, it's, a point, it's, point, it's a poignant exploration of the way this family deals with uh, aging and distance and being too busy. When it was first uh, uh, published, um, uh, um, released, um, the Japanese authorities didn't want it to go overseas because they were afraid that it was too Japanese. It wouldn't resonate uh, around the rest of the world enough. I can't think of a film that speaks more to the human condition of modern urban circumstances in London or New York or, where, or Hong Kong or wherever than Tokyo Story. Again, do please. Uh, download it and watch it. It's a marvellous film. And of course, I could extend this list a long way, drawing on the heritage of every European and Asian culture, one way or another. And yet, for all the commonalities, there was something unusual about European thought in particular. And I think it's worth focusing on it. Uh, and that's its extensive exploration, not just of the metaphysics of the soul, not just of life experience, but of the nature of the self itself. Over centuries of European thought, a thread was woven which is part analytical, part experiential, uh, and indeed very personal in some cases, by such widely different figures as Augustine, Luther, Locke, Kant, the great romantics Nietzsche, Freud, Heidegger, Foucault, Derrida, all the way into present times. And the result has been an increasingly nuanced understanding of the self as part conscious, part subconscious, dependent on memory, on language, on context, as well as on an inalienable and mysterious core, which is human, individual, and autonomous in some way. There have been European skeptics that have tried to dissolve that inner core, and yet never quite successfully. And this European journey into the nature of the self is distinctive. Confucian culture, the bedrock of Chinese philosophy, is pragmatically uninterested in the phenomenology of the self. It is greatly interested in setting the individual in the wider family, social, and even cosmic contexts. So it has much to say about the purposes and obligations of life in the different roles that humans find themselves born into but not much about the mystery of being the self as such. In European terms, Confucius is more akin to Aristotle than to Plato, and indeed the parallels between Confucius and Aristotle on the nature and purpose of human life are actually quite striking. Hindu thought is, by contrast, profoundly metaphysical and oscillates between a fascination for the limitless variety of being and a search for the oneness that infuses all being. This generates endless discussion about the nature of the soul, but at neither pole is the actual nature of individual consciousness a central interest of the Hindu world view. Islamic thought in its medieval heyday borrowed strongly from both Plato and Aristotle, 
the synthesis, which was then profoundly influential in medieval Christian uh, thought. It was interested in the theological standing of the soul, for which on the whole Plato was more helpful than Aristotle was, uh, and in the roles and obligations of life, based of course on the Quran and on the Hadith, uh, but for which it found the teleology of Aristotle a useful background. But again, it was rather less interested in the phenomenon of the conscious self as such, which it rather took for granted and assumed that the uh, distinctive characteristic of the human self was its rationality. Avicenna is explicit about that. What were the origins of this European fascination with the self? Well, uh, its Christian heritage and its classical heritage have something to do with this, of course. Uh, especially, I would suggest, the role of St. Paul and the enormous influence of St. Augustine. Uh, but to explore this f fully would take me beyond my area of competence and beyond the time we've got uh, uh, available this morning. The question for now is, why is this relevant to the future of Eurasia and the challenges it faces? For two reasons, I think. First, this European exploration of human experience has obvious implications for ethics and politics as, for example, Locke, Rousseau, and Kant were all perfectly aware. And for better or worse, the export of European political ideas and systems of thought has irrevocably changed and impacted all the other cultures of Eurasia. Uh, you see this most obviously, of course, through uh, American liberalism and through communism, which, of course, was a European export. But secondly, and much more fundamentally than that, the whole thrust of that exploration of the self, which so intrigued the Europeans, is precisely that it is a continuing journey of discovery, both individually and collectively. And we owe to another European thinker who has changed thought patterns throughout the world the insight that this journey will involve the recognition of opposites and the possibility of conflict and the desirability of a synthesis through that interaction. For Aristotle, as for Confucius, humans are by nature social beings. For Hegel, the self is unavoidably torn between attraction and estrangement in its relations with the other. The possibility of destructive conflict is intrinsic to our self-awareness, and this contra uh, con uh, contradiction is resolved only if the self can pass from a self-destructive individualism to a higher synthesis which embraces the other and thereby discovers its true individuality. This is the essence, of course, of Hegel's famous dialectic. It tells us that human development can never be linear and has an intrinsic element of conflict and struggle which it is necessary to work through in order to reach a newer, higher, better synthesis. In his terms, uh, if individualism is the thesis and the other is the antithesis to begin with, the higher synthesis is the true and full individuality for which we should strive. Hegel applies his dialectical principle in a whole variety of areas, uh, uh, in many of which we wouldn't choose to follow him today. In the study of the human mind and its consciousness, in his analysis of the development of human family and society relationships, in his analysis of the state, we certainly wouldn't wish to follow him down that route, um, and in a controversial his theory of, hum of history, which, which for the most part, 20th century commentary has seen as ponderous and quixotic metaphysics to be rejected outright. But there is a growing recognition that we are essentially language animals, that we discover our individuality only in dialogue, and Hegel's insight was that all fruitful dialogue is in fact dialectic. Only through such dialectic can we pass from conflictual individualism to the synthesis which represents true individuality. And only thus do we discover what universal values really are. The influential German philosopher Gadamer who died in 2002 at the ripe old age of 102, put it in essentially Hegelian terms, that the relationship with what we experience is always with a thou and not with an it. What in all of this gives us insight into the historic challenges of the next century? 
I think the answer is that only if we imagine such a dialectic amongst the great European world, uh, Eurasian, great Eurasian world cultures, will we reach a synthesis in which we discover our shared individuality and the shared and universal values of humanity. Only thus will we achieve a sense of common purpose which is universal enough to meet the existential challenges that we face this century. So we cannot avoid the journey for all of its risks because the risks of staying at home, as it were, of avoiding the dialectic, are overwhelmingly greater. We can no longer afford to treat the other as alien, as threatening, and as unreachable. And we will discover that it's a journey without return, because what we have learned cannot, I suggest, be unlearned. The individual cannot, leaving aside the pathology of dementia, of course, become less self-aware, even if there can be plenty of resistance to becoming more self-aware. As individuals, we know that this journey can be painful, but we also know that as long as we keep going, it is always fruitful and enriching and maturing. Collectively, we're on such a journey of self-discovery too. Our increasingly urbanized, culturally fluid connectivity necessarily means that whole cultures will be taken on this journey, kind of whether they like it or not, and will be changed. The essentials for growth on this journey are the same for individuals, for societies, for cultures, for nations, for any form of shared human identity, in fact. And we know what they are, do we not? Coming to terms with our pasts, that's a whole agenda, both individually and collectively. Taking responsibility for what we are and do. Looking for the human in the other. And always looking to learn. All this is essential to grow as individuals, we know that, it's essential to grow as cultures too. And in no case is the journey over. In no case have we arrived. In many cases, the state, or indeed the demos, may seek to control or impede the journey. And in fact, such controlling or blocking behavior is widespread at any moment in time, as we know all too well. But the connectivity of urbanization is a rising tide, and no dike will keep its waters out forever. And so I think that we have to approach the challenges not with indifference, not with pessimism, not with naive optimism, but with hope and commitment. Because the long term intrudes on us now, and it haunts us because it will afflict our grandchildren. I want to end on a note that I ended on, the, on uh, where are we, a uh, Monday evening. Um, I want to quote the great Catholic uh, theologian, philosopher Hans Kuhn, who I had the privilege of meeting a couple of times, and who once said to me, uh, we must learn to judge others by their best and not just by their worst. All words are in that are important. As we would want them to judge us by our best and not just by our worst. This seems to me to be as important and relevant now as when he said it to me a few years back. It applies to each of us as individuals, of course. It applies to each society. It applies to the major powers of the 21st century as they engage with each other warily. Because without such a readiness to learn and seek the common good, the future that we bequeath to our grandchildren will indeed be grim. Thank you. <laughs>